thanks everyone for coming today and this uh, weird world we're all living in post the pandemic we have a mix of a physical event here in the Gresham Hotel in Dublin and an online event through Microsoft Teams as well but today we're going to be discussing the AMBER project and just the final dissemination event for that. The AMBER project stands for the assessment methodology for the building energy rating and it's a research project that was funded by SEI back in 2018. So just to very quickly go through the agenda and um, we've had our networking session right here in Gresham and now I'm going to spend 15 minutes just giving you a quick introduction to the project and then I'll hand over to Trinity College Dublin where they'll go through some of the IQ analysis and some of the advice generated from that. Then Dr. Ruth Kerrigan will talk about the CO2 dashboards that were deployed during the project. After that, myself and Ruth will talk about performance gap and what the importance of digital twins and how we use them within Amber. Then I'll very quickly touch on the health and well-being analysis that was done for the A-rated buildings as part of the project. COVID-19 impact on building design, which is a very interesting case study that came out of Amber. And finally, we'll finish up with talking about Okulin and their partnership with the Amber project. So, and just before we get started as well, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. And if anybody here in the room has any questions, um, I'll repeat them for all of our online attendees. So without further ado, let's get started. So as mentioned, Amber was funded by SEI under their or D&D program back in 2018. And the project collected data from domestic and commercial A-rated buildings. With this data, we wanted to investigate methods for reducing the performance gap in the building energy rating system in Ireland and assess the indoor environmental quality of these A-rated buildings to improve the design of A-rated buildings moving forward. Quick introduction to who the Amber Consortium was. First of all, there was IES. IES are a software company that produced software for the built environment. So one of our main softwares is the virtual environment, which is used for the design of new buildings, the retrofit of existing buildings. And it's also used in a lot of compliance frameworks, such as the SBEM here in Ireland. It also can be used for BREAM and LEED and other green rating schemes. So besides modeling all of the Amber buildings within the project on our software, we were also the project managers in charge of all the technical and financial management. Our university partner is Trinity College Dublin. Now they took the lead on the indoor environmental quality. Over the last couple of years, they've been investigating all of the environmental data collected in the project and generating recommendations for all of the building occupants from that, and also giving feedback back to policy designers and building designers uh, on how to improve the design of buildings moving forward. One of the main stakeholders in the project was Okulin Co-Housing Alliance. Okulin are a housing association that focus on generating estates that are affordable and that have a sustainability ethos. So they're a really great partner to have involved with Amber because a lot of the residents that were uh, living in the Okulin estates, they were very focused on energy efficiency and they were really engaged and active within the project. Uh, finally, our last stakeholder was the Royal Institute of Architects Ireland. They were involved primarily in the first year of the project. They helped us identify A-rated buildings to become part of the project. And we presented the AMBER project at some of their educational and CPD events. So we had a wide range of building typologies and research participants in the project split into domestic and commercial. On the domestic side, as mentioned, we had Okul and Co-Housing Alliance, and we had two of their housing estates located in Ballymun in North Dublin. The other uh, domestic housing estate we had was Wicklow County Council. So they have a new social housing estate based near Bray. We had 29 of their units there that we were able to do with the environmental analysis on. On to the commercial side, we found out during the project that a lot of, say, commercial offices and things like that weren't A-rated, which didn't fit the bill for the AMBER project. So we, a lot of our attention was focused on public buildings, such as schools and HSC buildings. So we got 12 A-rated schools from BAM contractors. They were the facility managers for these schools, and they really were. There was a wide geographical spread. We had some in West Cork, we had some in Donegal. So we did really travel around our Ireland, uh, putting in sensors in those schools. Uh, we also had another school located in Dublin city centre, which was a lot closer, thankfully. 
And we also had three HSC buildings. They were basically primary care centres and residential buildings uh, that were part of the HSC umbrella. So very over the next couple of slides, I'm just going to give you an introduction to what we did in the project, and then we'll get into the detail in the following sections. So first of all, we needed to collect environmental data from all of the buildings within Amber. And the way we did that is we used these lower one sensors. So very early on in the project, we realized we couldn't be relying on people's Wi-Fi in the domestic houses. We couldn't be using domestic people's Wi-Fi or similarly in commercial buildings. We didn't want to rely on their Wi-Fi, especially when in commercial buildings they change passwords and things like that. So very early on, we had to find another solution and it was these lower one sensors. So these use a lower a LoRa network to connect to something called the Tings network. And this basically uses a radio frequency to send data, which we connected back to the IES platform. So no need for Wi-Fi. And what these sensors collect is information on temperature, relative humidity and carbon dioxide. Uh, in one of the sites as well, we also uh, deployed a weather station to look at the external weather conditions for that particular site. So when installing these sensors, the first thing that we did was use Velcro strips so that they didn't damage walls. There was no need for drills and screws and all of that kind of thing. And in the domestic homes, we put four or five sensors in each home. This would be the living room, kitchen, main bedroom, and either the second bedroom, ensuite, or bathroom. And the one last thing when placing them, we had to put them in certain areas, as shown as the little, in the little image there. We couldn't put them near doors or openings, or we had to keep them away from radiators and things like that. So the best place to put them was on the wall, away from everything, or on the roof, um, away from everything as well. So to collect and analyze all of this data, uh, we had to use the following software platform produced by IES called iScan. iScan is a cloud platform that allows for the centralization and collection of real-time data from a number of different sources. So whether it be from BMS, any other energy metering infrastructure, and from the lower one sensors themselves, we could collect all of this data and bring it all back into one platform. So on this platform, if we wanted to see a correlation such as we want to compare the temperature in a particular room to the energy usage at that particular time, we could. We can correlate and look at different insights on the iScan platform. Uh, iScan also has the ability to incorporate machine learning, and we have a few machine learning embedded rules on iScan. One, for example, is a data gaps rule. So anywhere we did have data gaps, we were able to fill in the missing data gaps based on historical data. Also on iScan, we were able to set up customized alerts. So this is very important for the project actually, because if we wanted to in periods of uncomfort, we could set up alert and give someone a notification if something was going wrong in regards to environmental conditions or thermal comfort. But also this is great for monitoring the equipment. So say if the scent, there was a problem with a sensor or if there was a problem with a gateway or anything like that, we could set up an alert based off the battery's voltage and we can get an instant notification when something bad happens and we need to go on site to fix it. And the last thing I want to touch on is we also have customizable dashboards uh, on iScan. So these are basically a front end and completely customizable and we can create different dashboards for different end users. Uh, one of the sections will focus on this, how we created and designed dashboards targeted at students and teachers for all of the buildings or for all of the schools that were part of the project. And the last thing I want to touch on is the different software packages used uh, within the project and how these all kind of married together. So as I mentioned uh, on, a, on a previous slide, uh, IES is most famous software, the virtual environment is used across the world by thousands of engineers and it's using for designing and doing dynamic simulation modeling of buildings. So we pair that with all the live operational data we're getting from iScan to create calibrated models. And this is what we use for the assessment of the building energy rating. So the combination of this is, is are both part of our intelligent communities lifecycle software package. And this is what IES uses to create digital twins of building that act like it's re their real counterparts. And that's it for the first section. If anybody has any questions, either in the room or online, feel free to ask. Nope. Okay, um, I just 
just like to ask uh, Roger West to come to the stage and is there a question on the chat? Uh, no, so the data we collected within the Amber project isn't available open source. We've used an open source cloud storage platform called the Things Network to collect the data, but the actual data itself isn't open source. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Like, is there any way we can access that data for the research purpose? Um, well, what we ha what we will be doing is, you know, producing research papers and making basically what we can make public, we will make public and try to share with as many people as po possible. Due to GDPR and a few other data protection issues, we can't give you access to the actual data yourself. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to ask Roger to come to the stage now to do the next presentation. Good, thank you very much, Ian. Um, just confirm uh, that you can hear me all right, yes? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, good. Oh, well, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, Roger West is my name, and uh, I, I work as part of a, a three person team. Uh, Pat Shiel, uh, is my colleague in Trinity and Niti Saini uh, is also part of the uh, Trinity team uh, where we've worked very closely with the IES team, which uh, primarily have been Ruth Kerrigan, uh, Ian Ricardo and uh, Hugh. Uh, from Okulon, uh, th that's the team of seven that's been working very closely together for the last two and a half years on this program. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, their assistance, particularly in in the uh, presenting uh, the analytics that I'm going to show you. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you uh, some technical details, uh, which won't be of interest to all of you, but will certainly I hope be of interest to some, uh, because uh, I'm going to start by talking about the 100 houses that we've been looking at. Uh, and then uh, we'll be joined by Pat, who's going to talk about the commercial properties. Um, and uh, with 100 houses, uh, we had four different groups, uh, as you can see on the slide, as Ian's already mentioned. Uh, and uh, because there's so much data there, um, many millions uh, of pieces of data, uh, which we've gathered over the last two and a half years or so, um, I'm going to focus just on group one to demonstrate the types of things that we've been looking at and the sort of conclusions we've been coming to. Uh, so I'm going to focus on group group one uh, today. Um, one of the advantages of um, working in groups is that if you just take the first one, group one, uh, is that the houses were uh, um, carefully designed, obviously, but they're very similar to each other. Um, the, the main difference is, is uh, orientation, uh, the size of the house in terms of the occupancy levels, and whether it's mid terrace, end terrace or detached, there were very few detached houses. So what that means is that when we start getting data in from almost identical houses, it allows us to examine the uh, differences that occur as a consequence of family behavior, as distinct from trying to understand um, the building physics and the building dynamics with regard to the various things that we've been measuring. Again, to give you an idea as to the extent of uh, the data that we gathered, um, with 100 houses, this is just uh, the data for one day for one house. And uh, as Ian mentioned, and it's no harm in seeing it in black and white, um, we had most houses, we had five sensors. These were the areas of the house which are uh, uh, most likely to be occupied, and in particular, uh, generating CO2 and H2O and choosing a particular comfortable temperature uh, in the various rooms at different parts of the day. Um, and um, by an examination of the various international documents, there isn't necessarily a, a, a typical temperature or relative humidity or CO2 that one might find acceptable. But broadly speaking, you would expect the temperature to be somewhere between 18 and 22 degrees throughout the year. The relative humidity somewhere between 50 and 70 percent. 
And CO2 would typically be around about 800, but up to 1500, um, there shouldn't really be any uh, cause for concern. So these are the kind of thresholds that we're looking to see whether our data falls within these thresholds. And the iScan uh, analytics enables us to do that very efficiently. So on the top left hand corner here, you can see, for example, uh, for the five rooms, uh, you can see the variation in the temperature. And in, in particular there, um, the main bedroom is a little bit higher at nighttime, as you can see, uh, where people are, uh, the, the main bedrooms are usually dual occupancy, though not always. Uh, and then on the right hand, top right hand corner, uh, you can see how the humidity varies. You'll understand, of course, that temperature and humidity are interlinked insofar as when the temperature goes up, uh, the humidity goes down, all other things being equal. Uh, so therefore, reading the relative humidity on its own doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not there's more moisture in the air. Uh, nonetheless, the relative humidity is, is the reading that we get. Uh, and you can see, for example, in this uh, graph in the top right hand corner, um, that um, there were uh, two cases of cooking, uh, we, we, we guess, uh, going on inside the kitchen and um, were, of course, not party to what uh, the, the, the members of the household are doing, but we can certainly infer what they're doing uh, by taking additional evidence. Uh, for example, if you see that uh, there's practically no change in the temperature, you might think there's no heating on, so you can verify that by looking at the CO2. And if the CO2 doesn't rise, um, the principal source of CO2, of course, is human beings in a room, uh, then you can deduce that there's nobody in that room at that time. Um, sometimes the temperature goes up due to solar gain, uh, and again, you can discern that, and I'll be giving you some examples of that. And the bottom right hand corner there uh, is a typical one for uh, um, CO2. And again, uh, in this graph here, you can see that in the main bedroom, which was the black graph, uh, uh, is that uh, when you don't have adequate ventilation in a bedroom, is that um, the CO2 level builds up uh, over time. And it stays approximately constant then during the course of the night. And then obviously when the doors are opened and people leave the room uh, is it drops then during the course of the day. So these are matters that we would look at very closely to identify why the CO2 might be very high in a particular room. For example, in a living room, if you keep the doors closed and the ventilation is not working properly and you have a, three or four people uh, in that room for four or five hours in the evening, then you will see very clearly not only the humidity going up, because of course humans emit moisture as well, uh, but you'll certainly see the CO2 going up in that room. So these are the things that we were particularly looking for. Um, because we have such a large amount of data, uh, it, it means that we can analyze the data in different ways. So here's a, a typical example where we've taken the results for all the houses in the group one set. So that's 44 houses, and we've looked at typical average uh, values in the morning on the left and at nighttime on the right. And we've looked at it through the four seasons. And uh, what we can see is that these are, uh, um, first of all, well insulated houses, uh, houses that have a, a very reasonable temperatures. Uh, um, and uh, during the course of the winter, as you can imagine, the temperature drops somewhat. And during the summer, particularly with solar gain, even though the heating is off, uh, the temperatures are somewhat higher. And we can also see where there are things that need to draw our attention. For example, uh, the green uh, shaded cells here are where the values are lower than we might expect, or certainly the lowest of the group. And the orange ones are the ones where they're slightly higher. So, for example, uh, if we look at the master bedroom uh, in both the morning and the nighttime, uh, we can see that the CO2 levels are relatively high on average. And these are only the average values, uh, well above the 800 that uh, we would normally expect. And that might uh, give reason for us to investigate this data a little bit more closely. So you can imagine there's a wealth of data here and uh, we have to use uh, our experience and our judgment to decide which of the particular cases we're going to look at, uh, what might be the causes of that, and there could be multiple causes. And then uh, we, we have, uh, with IES, uh, developed models of the building, uh, the various buildings, and then we can simulate uh, um, uh, physical effects, such as opening a window leaving an ensuite door open, those types of physical effects to identify uh, what might be the causes of relatively high values of any one of the three parameters. So to give you an idea of the variety, um, on the left hand side, we have winter results um, uh, for temperature above and um, uh, for humidity uh, down below. And on the right hand side is for the summer. So the average values are as they were in the last slide, but you can see the very wide variety uh, that occurs. So these are peak values and uh, minim minimum and maximum values. 
So there's a, a wide variety there and the temperatures can vary in some cases down to 14 degrees or in other cases above 30 degrees. So again, um, these might only be once off peak values for short periods of time, which probably wouldn't concern us too much. But if it's a humidity value, for example, that's sustained, then there could be a real risk of mold growth occurring. And that could be due to uh, a lack of ventilation because of an intervention uh, by the family. So under normal circumstances, you would expect the uh, design of the house. Uh, and we haven't discussed the details of how, how, the, how these houses were designed. But in essence, they have continuous background uh, um, monitoring of relative humidity in, for example, the ensuite. Uh, which would keep um, the ventilation, mechanical ventilation going. On the other hand, there is um, uh, active uh, trickle vents on the windows. So as the humidity goes up, the trickle vents open and then they close to a minimum. Uh, and that's how they're in intended to design uh, or designed to, to behave. Um, on the other hand, if the occupants decide not to use those facilities, for example, uh, if they experience uh, a cold draft for any reason, uh, they might decide to close one of those off. Uh, and of course, in any house, uh, closing off the ventilation is not uh, a good idea because it does lead to enhanced rate of humidity leading potentially to mold growth and also to high CO2 levels leading to uh, lethargy, uh, loss of energy and so on. Um, so uh, here's um, uh, the equivalent graph then for CO2, and we can see straight away uh, here that all the averages are 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 not particularly uh, concerning. Um, the peak values certainly are. We're getting up to more than nearly 5,000 parts per million of CO2, uh, where typically above 1,500 is something that we should uh, be uh, concerned about. So there are plenty of cases there, as you can see, uh, for values above that. So we need to investigate why in some houses the system seems to be working very well, and in other houses um, it's not working quite so well. Although I would, um, again, uh, caution people not to draw too much of a conclusion in respect of this because it might be just a once-off short-term uh, uh, value, in which case we wouldn't be too concerned about it. So these are peak values in orange and the lowest values in, in black. Now, the data that we have, of course, is which is uh, voluminous, um, enables us to investigate uh, things like uh, the occupancy levels, uh, how many people are in a house and how often they're there, uh, um, the orientation of the house and what influence that has, uh, what type of house, because we, we might expect that an end terrace house might might experience something different to a mid terrace house, for example, because one is well insulated by its neighbours, the other one isn't. And most importantly for us here is the family behaviour, occupant behaviour, and how the occupant behaviour can influence how well these houses work compared to how they were designed to work. Um, and what we find, again, there's many conclusions I could draw, and I've just made a, a, picked a few, a selection of slides just to give you an idea. Uh, so here's a, um, a system whereby we're looking at what's the consequence of having an end, an end terrace house as compared with a mid terrace. Uh, certainly there's a perception there that the end terraces would be colder. But in fact, um, we can see that the variations in the average temperatures in these houses are uh, um, uh, over the various months. So we're looking at different months here uh, um, is, is it's, it's almost random. So the reason for that, of course, is that the end terrace houses are very well insulated and therefore they behave almost uh, they almost behave as though there was another house right beside it uh, because they're so well insulated. So the, the main influencing factors as will emerge uh, uh, for the differences in the average temperature is actually uh, down to orientation for some rooms. Uh, that is whether it's getting solar gain, but equally importantly as to the behaviour of the occupants. And really it's these uh, uh, variations in the trends that we're particularly interested in to see if we can explain uh, the differences between them. Um, and again, uh, um, if we look at these is uh, a plot with four of the, of the room types, the kitchen, the living room, uh, the master bedroom and the second bedroom. And uh, what we've done here is we've looked at temperature and looked at uh, um, the uh, orientation. So this is an examination of orientation where down the bottom you can see everything through from east, northeast, north, northwest and so on uh, uh, for the summer and the winter. So you can see there's a lot of data here represented in these and these are average conditions. In, in the houses in group one. 
And from this, we see certain trends emerging. We can certainly see that uh, the blue bars, which is temperatures less than 18, are more prevalent uh, uh, in the winter, of course, as you might expect. And generally speaking, though not always, they're more prevalent on the north facing sides, though the sun is less of an influence in the winter, surprisingly, than it does in the summer because um, people put the heat on in the winter and therefore the temperatures go up. On the other hand, uh, the exceedances, as we call them, exceeding the limits that we're particularly interested in, um, the yellow bars are represent, represent temperatures above 25 degrees. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you can see uh, solar, the benefits of solar gain in the summer, for example, and indeed in the winter. Uh, and um, perhaps some people prefer to have uh, their rooms at a higher temperature. So they would use more energy uh, by leaving the heating on for longer, uh, for longer periods of time to higher temperatures, uh, because that's their personal choice. So again, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, um, um, certainly as, as, as a general trend, if you're comfortable keeping a jumper on, then it would probably be uh, preferable in terms of minimizing energy costs and carbon footprints if, if one were to keep your jumper on and reduce the temperature down if you're comfortable with that. So uh, this is um, a series of plots uh, just for one day in one room, and we've superimposed them on top of each other because uh, um, I, I think it's important to appreciate the complexity of what is happening uh, inside houses. So here we uh, get a variety of things happening. As I say, they are all uh, on the same day, all in master bedrooms and all in terrace. So that means the, the reason for these differences is probably due to human behavior as distinct from anything else. So for example, the more gentle curves that you can see here are probably solar gain during the day as the temperature rises. The more sudden increases are due to people putting the heat on for whatever reason. And you can also see that people put heat on at different times. Uh, so some people have it coming on in the morning. Some people might be working at home. They might put it on during the day and some people put it on in the evening uh, uh, for, for various reasons. Also uh, in a curve such as these, you can spot the rooms that are north facing because remember, these are on the same day in the same location. So if some of them are gaining solar uh, from a solar sense, um, other ones are not because they're north facing. So again, we can interpret this data um, by inference, uh, not because we were personally there, although we did have a fully active um, external uh, weather station here. So we could corroborate the evidence uh, with when the sun was shining or not, as the case may be. And indeed, there was a light sensor in the low-run sensors as well. So you can see the complexity of the data, and I'll just give a couple of examples here. Um, the one on the left, I've circled uh, a situation where we get solar gain occurring uh, on the left-hand side in the in the green curve, and then beside that is the orange curve, where clearly somebody has put um, the the heating on and left it on. Um, we can also see and discern uh, um, the the rapid uh, increase in temperature, showing the efficiency of the system, and then the relatively slow decrease in the temperature, showing how well the rooms uh, retain the heat when the heating is off. This again gives us indicators for human behavior, where as many of us indeed in our own homes, uh, we decide to turn the heating off well in advance of going to bed because we don't need residual heat in the room once we've gone to bed. So again, there are efficiencies to be had there in human behavior. On the right hand side, uh, the same temperature, uh, this time in a north orientation. So there's no evidence in this graph of solar gain, as you might expect. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the heating comes on several times, as you can see uh, in the upper curve. But also there's a purple one there, which would indicate that perhaps um, no heating is coming on in this room and there may be a slight increase due to bodily heat. That's possible. So if I had any doubts about whether or not this room was occupied, I would corroborate my inference by going to the CO2 sensor. And that would tell me whether or not it was likely there was one person in the room or indeed two people in the room. So you can see how we gather the bits of evidence together to try and understand uh, how the uh, building uh, behaves uh, be depending on uh, physical geometrical design characteristics on the one hand and the assumptions that we make as designers as to how we expect it to behave and then compare that with uh, perhaps some inefficiencies uh, which could be due uh, to the way in which people operate uh, the buildings could be. 
Um, here's another graph, and this one was based on whether people were working uh, at home or whether they were uh, going uh, outside the home to work. And uh, the two relevant graphs are the two lower ones on the left and the right. And there was no real evidence for that. Um, uh, it depends very much on the comfort levels that people have uh, and uh, ha whether or not they have the heating on or, or, or not, uh, whether or not they ventilate the spaces that they're in uh, during the course of the day. So what we found was, uh, for example, on the right, um, is, is the group for the people who are who are um, uh, going to work. And you can see that there are incidences there of high levels of uh, PPM, uh, which as I say, is closely related to ventilation, of course, uh, and high levels of temperature is either due to solar or due to heating. But we found there was very little correlation between these two. It really came down to human behavior as distinct from whether or not they were uh, actually present. Uh, and uh, the differences that that made. Again, we can use the analytics, uh, and I'll go through these relatively quickly, um, uh, analytics as to the how, uh, um, how we're getting exceedances. So the top left-hand graph is a temperature graph, uh, and the yellow, uh, the yellow curves uh, represent uh, when it's more or less where we would like it to be between 18 and 25, which is the vast majority of the time. Uh, uh, the blue ones was where it was relatively cold, uh, and we have all 44 houses here, as you can see. Uh, and uh, again, um, th there are some cases where houses are less than 18 degrees some of the time. In fact, a substantial period of the time, maybe 50% of the time. And that's probably a personal choice of the people in the houses. On the other hand, there's very few red boxes, which means that there's only a few cases where people are running their houses at relatively high temperatures for whatever reason. And we can do the same. Uh, I won't go into the detail. We can do the same with the relative humidity on the right. Uh, we've left out the middling values, just the exceedances. Uh, and that is above 60% is gray and uh, above 80% is red. So the good news there is that um, in these houses, they seem to be very well ventilated because uh, for a very substantial part of the time, we're not exceeding uh, relative humidity values, which might give concern about mold growth. Um, at the bottom left hand corner, though, we do have more exceedances there uh, that is above 1500 in red. Um, so there's clearly a couple of houses there that we need to look closely in, into those houses to see why we're getting those exceedances. So in order to do that, uh, again, um, iScan is very flexible in the types of graphs that allows you to uh, present the data. So here's another way of looking at the same data for all 44 houses. Uh, and here we have exceedances of CO2. So I'm immediately attracted to a number of houses, for example, along the top line, the third one along is A3. And there you can see in the yellow box uh, is that we have uh, CO2 values above 1500. And if you go across one further row, row and uh, sorry, column and go down three rows, you can see D1, where again, there's a lot of yellow boxes. So this is a house that we'd want to uh, actually um, find out why these exceedances are happening when many of the other houses are performing very well for exactly the same design and the exactly the same orientation. Occupancy levels might be different. Uh, people may have indeed sealed off the vents uh, or turned off the mechanical ventilation. So these are things that we need to uh, uh, investigate and advise. Uh, similarly, with uh, simple things, um, uh, for example, when we have a shower and the ventilation is on, um, if you leave the shower door open from the ensuite into the master bedroom, and we have two cases here, on the left-hand side, um, the door was left open. And what happens is you might think that you're getting rid of the moisture in the air, and very quickly the ventilation, mechanical ventilation will do that. But you have a lot of residual moisture on surfaces, particularly the doors of the shower uh, uh, and the shower tray. So that moisture has to evaporate into the space. So if you close the door of the ensuite, the humidity is going to go up again. You leave it open, then that humidity is going to evaporate and it will diffuse into the main bedroom. So on the left hand side, we can clearly see that the door has been left open between the ensuite and the bathroom. Uh, and therefore, the humidity in the bedroom has gone up, sorry, the bedroom and the bedroom uh, humidity has gone up. On the right hand side, you can see in contrast to that. Uh, and this wasn't prompted, this is just real data uh, extracted from one case that we looked at. You can see that the ensuite door uh, was 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 closed. The humidity stayed higher for longer in that space uh, the, in the pink curve and the humidity in the uh, in, in the master bedroom stayed low. So therefore, you're, you're, you're more likely to get mold growth in the ensuite for sure and less likely to in the uh, bedroom. Indeed, our advice would be to leave the door from the bedroom into the landing or into the hallway, depending on where your bedroom is, to leave that open as well, because the distribution of that moisture as it evaporates uh, is, is has a relatively small impact on the humidity in the, in the entire building as compared with a confined space. Uh, on the right, um, I won't dwell on this, but uh, we, we can draw these correlation uh, graphs 
which enables us to try and draw some correlation between, for example, the ensuite humidity and the master bedroom humidity in order to try and understand the type of behavior which you can see on the left. Not a very strong correlation, as you can see, but in a controlled experiment where we always close the door or we always left it open, we'd expect much stronger correlations. Um, similarly, with the uh, effect of the trickle vents, and I, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but on the left hand side, um, you can see a case where uh, in, in, in certain months, uh, uh, the homeowner in this particular house, in this particular room, uh, had the vents open and we had relatively low values uh, down below 800 approximately during the night. And then the trickle vent was closed off for some reason. And you can see for the same occupancy level in the same room in the same house, you can see what the consequences of that is in terms of uh, the absence of ventilation causes much higher levels uh, and almost certainly single occupancy here. Uh, if it was double occupancy, I'd expect to see higher levels. Um, similarly, uh, on the left and the right hand side here, you can see the consequences of actually uh, uh, putting in uh, or allowing the natural ventilation of the property. On the left-hand side for humidity, you can see uh, the variations there. Now remember, the humidity will vary with temperature, so some of that will be due to temperature, uh, some will be due to extra moisture in the air due to the presence of humans and cooking and showers. Uh, and on, you can see the well-ventilated one as against the one that's not well-ventilated. So these are two different houses, the same bedroom, same orientation, different families, of course, and one of them is seeing a much higher levels of variation in the humidities. And similarly on the rest right hand side um, shows the uh, carbon dioxide uh, levels at night time being very high in a poorly ventilated space as compared with a similar bedroom in a well ventilated space. So we learned from this, of course, is that when we uh, uh, build houses and we hand over the house to the house uh, to the house owners, um, we can't simply just give them the key and expect them to not understand how the buildings behave. I think a, 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 a modest amount of information needs to be given to the house owners in, so they can understand uh, uh, to some degree as necessary um, how the house is likely to behave and how to get the best in, in, in environmental conditions within the space. So as a consequence of that, uh, um, uh, all seven members of the team uh, helped put their observations together. I'm not going to go through this slide, but to say that we, we looked at advice on carbon dioxide, uh, we looked at advice on uh, relative humidity and temperature. And when we put these pieces of advice together, uh, we developed an operational guide, which of course will be publicly available. Uh, and uh, this is something which we would like to think uh, could be given to house owners when they move into A-rated buildings where uh, um, the ventilation is uh, um, planned and where the ventilation it could be uh, less than in a traditional Irish house uh, because it's been designed to uh, uh, perform very well thermally. And uh, we did take a control group and give them advice about uh, some of the exceedances that we saw, which we were concerned about. And what we found, uh, and if you look at the diagram on the right, um, so this is a, a situation where we, we, we gave the list of a guidance to a householder which uh, was experiencing high levels of any of our three parameters. And you can see on the right hand side there, uh, after we had given advice before and after, you can see that when we believe that they did follow the advice because the typical levels of CO2 uh, uh, reduced uh, very substantially after we've given the advice. And we can verify this uh, because we have all the data, is that if we take uh, um, the, the averages for all the various houses, so before advice was given is the top set of tables, uh, and uh, uh, below it is the uh, uh, same data, but post advice. And the yellows and the reds are all the warning signs that things are not going as well as they should be. And below, uh, you can see here uh, uh, that the performance uh, has substantially improved. So that completes uh, um, what I was going to say uh, about the domestic properties. And um, my colleague, uh, Pat Scheel, unfortunately, is unavailable uh, today, but he has uh, pre-recorded uh, uh, the points that he wanted to make. And then when we get to the end of this session, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. With apologies to my colleagues for running slightly over. Hi there, um, I'm Pat Shield, and as part of the Trinity uh, College Under Group, um, I've been working on the IV2 aspects of both housing and commercial buildings for Hamburg. Uh, I, I 
The leader of the West has already covered the materials we presented on the phones that we monitored for the past three years or so. Um, as for commercial buildings, we were struck early on at the scarcity of a range in this sector, uh, which is probably not surprising given the recent departure requirements for NZ buildings are. Um, however, we managed to team up with both the um, public private partnership building contractor BAT and the HSE to find suitably recent builds. Uh, we also found a leader partner in St. Patrick's Cathedral School. Uh, we took a very keen interest in what we did offer and the results. So, to start with, um, St. Patrick's Cathedral School is located or is co located with St. Patrick's Cathedral. A recent major expansion in classroom numbers um, resulted in an A rating extension, which is separated from the old school by a corridor and as such qualifies for inclusion. The, uh, the bank schools are all very large, 1,000 plus student facilities with very up to date modern uh, facilities included. Uh, these are spread throughout the country, literally almost from end to end to end. Um, and they each have a dedicated facility manager. The HSC buildings are also very recent, very substantial and encompass two primary residential healthcare buildings and one primary health clinic. Um, the residential units are fully occupied and care is provided on a 24-7 basis. Hi there, um, I'm Pat Shield, and as part of the. Sorry. Yeah. So, our principal objective um, in the commercial buildings was to determine if the air region has affected the internal air quality. And in all cases, in cases where I'm going to present for schools and to the HSE buildings, um, a very simple control of heating was all that was in place. And um, all the schools are naturally ventilated by operable windows. So in the case of the BAM schools, there were a pair of temperature sensors per floor and coupled with timer clocks, but that, that in essence was the control of the heating system. Um, very close monitoring was present on the BMX, so the building management system for energy usage with multiple submeters connected. And I suppose it's also fair to say that in general, very little emphasis is placed on fresh air volume monitoring, which probably only local feedback on carbon dioxide in some of the bad schools. Um, and in, in virtually all cases, in speaking to my teachers and staff present, uh, that, that those CO2 monitors that are purely wall hanging local measurements, it, it didn't seem to have caused either the staff or students to react to any high levels of CO2. So our principal objective. So as several of my colleagues already mentioned, COVID has played absolute havoc with recruitment, access to, and the ongoing normal usage of these schools. However, COVID also provides us with a glimpse into what could be possible with strong and persuasive government advice on building operation. Uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral School in particular allowed us to monitor classrooms both pre and post COVID. And I have to say that that data has proven that is absolutely invaluable. Um, now, it would also be fair to say that given my own experience with IAQ control, particularly in German and Austrian schools, where a thousand parts per billion is regarded as the max permitted before automatic tempered ventilation initiates, um, we have taken about 1200 parts per billion as our own trigger point in this analysis. So, as several of my colleagues are, we can see here a very typical example of a classroom, specifically in St. Patrick's Cathedral School, pre and post COVID, 
showing the relationship between carbon dioxide or CO2 levels before COVID when windows were not used um, particularly frequently and post-COVID when the government's advice was being followed closely. These are the two upper graphs. So during, during that same week, um, we can also see in the lower graphs the air temperature measured in the same classroom or classroom, uh, again pre and post-COVID. So we can so we can very evidently see that the temperatures remain more consistent with higher boiler output while windows are in operation after each class. And this was obviously the case in post-COVID uh, scenario. So what we also saw is that these better levels of carbon dioxide control are evident across all the classrooms when the pre and post COVID data is examined. Um, the, the evidence is showing across all classrooms for the 800 parts per million and 1200 parts per million levels, these are plotted for each classroom and the level of exceedance that we can see at 1200 parts per million and um, it shows to be extremely low post-COVID, falling from about 40% exceedance level beforehand to below 10% with good manual ventilation policy in place. And I have to stress the word manual in this instance. Now, if we move on to the BAM schools, um, which obviously make up the majority of the schools in our study, um, evidence shows near full compliance with the manual ventilation directions from the Department of Education. So these, these graphs shown on this slide are there just to pinpoint a rare occasion of less than five data where the windows are clearly not in operation for, for most of the day. The comfort temperature levels are probably going to be interesting to follow this winter, if the manual ventilation actions are pursuing by staff on our students, meaning if those windows are operated um, after each class, um, it will be interesting to see both how the temperature responds uh, within those classrooms during the particularly cold weather, and also to see how the energy levels, our, our energy usage levels, being increased as a result. Now we move on to the band school. So we move on to the HSE buildings, um, of which there are three. And um, so these graphs are from the HSE primary residential units, where almost 40 sensors are installed in the largest of the facilities. So we can see in the bedroom and on the suite settings, while it's fully and continuously occupied. So with the help of newly installed window trickle vents, a level of exceedance beyond 800 parts per million is very, very low. Uh, this, this pattern is actually replicated throughout the HSE buildings. So, so we'll move on to the HSE buildings. January 21 during the COVID month of the year. Um, it's not surprising residents may have asked for trickle gates to be closed up fully and in other words sealed. So we can see the levels of 800 parts per million are clearly evident across a number of bedroom but on, on speed settings. But the same rooms are very, very clear at 1500 parts per million. Um, and I should note here that the on suites are mechanically ventilated. January 21. So I guess out of all of that, there are some obvious conclusions. So as far as natural ventilated spaces are concerned, some action is obviously required on the part of staff or students to ensure that the IAQ thermal dioxide level remains under control. These actions are being devised and implemented with great success, ranging among our cohort of schools. 
and uh, I must say a lot of congratulations are required for both staff and students uh, in this regard. Uh, as far as the HSC buildings are concerned, they are seen to be performing especially well, particularly given uh, they are housing elderly residents in long-term settings, um, who will obviously feel the cold and drafts especially over the winter. So given they are operating with triple vents in the bedrooms and mechanical extracts in the adjoining of suite, they are actually performing very, very well. So there's a couple of questions that remain about the manual nature of this intervention as, as, as prescribed by our government um, as to how long this will last, particularly during the worst of the winter. And another question, I guess, is the estimation of the energy burden of these actions. And uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this later. And for, for sure, further research is going to be required, and hopefully these points might guide that work. Thank you very much. So I guess out of all of that, there are Okay, uh, Roger here again. Um, um, just quite a number of questions um, in the chat room, and I'm not sure we'll have time to take them all, but I'll, I'll just take a quick look. Um, Uh, how, how are most of the aerated houses ventilated? I, I, I explained that at the, at the very outset, uh, uh, that they have um, uh, uh, trickle vents on the windows, uh, which are triggered by uh, or H, high or H values, uh, but have a minimum opening. Uh, and there is background uh, ventilation uh, in the ensuite. Um, how reliable are the sensor readings? Uh, were they validated? Yes, uh, we, we uh, all of the um, sensors were calibrated before we started. And as you probably know, uh, you do have to recalibrate sensors after a period of time. Um, Yeah, the, the, when you say standards and guidelines, um, th there's a process of in, in, in the design of the houses themselves, which of course were, were, were followed, um, but there isn't always a consensus on the thresholds. We've already seen that with what Pat said a few moments ago, uh, um, uh, where different standards are used in different countries. Uh, uh, so there's no hard and fast universal rule with respect to what the thresholds are. But uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, there's there's good evidence there, for example, as to what levels of relative humidity uh, uh, might give rise to mold growth in the right circumstances, because whether or not mold, gro mold growth occurs, it depends on a number of parameters other than just the relative humidity. Um, we didn't pick specific ventilation regimes for, for the buildings. Um, we allowed the owners and occupants, the occupants, owners of the houses, uh, uh, to operate the houses in the normal way. We gave them no guidance at the start. We wanted to see what their natural response was, uh, but we did make, as I said, an intervention uh, about halfway through uh, and gave some people advice and uh, didn't give other people advice so that we could compare the changes in the behaviour uh, between the two. Um, How did we observe the occupancy patterns? Well, again, we, we were very keen not to interfere uh, in the normal day-to-day -day events, uh, but um, uh, relative humidity has a slightly, yeah, relative humidity has a slightly uh, less sensitive effect with regard to humans. Uh, uh, CO2 is a better one in a confined space. Um, so it's very easy to see from the CO2 values uh, when they go up, uh, whether or not there is a uh, occupancy of a particular space. So we did not monitor people at all. We didn't want to interfere with them. Um, they were really very good to allow us to put the sensor uh, in, in the space. And uh, the sensor was about the size of a fire alarm and it didn't interfere with them at all. Uh, but uh, we, we didn't have access to the houses or indeed to be able to conduct uh, any interviews in respect of uh, what their behavior was. Uh, we had to use modeling and the evidence from the sensors to infer what we believe to be the best estimate as to what was going on. Um, uh, the question of lower COVID uh, CO2 levels post COVID um, uh, in, in the schools, it was it was very clear. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that's probably what it's related to. The question came in at 
20 past uh, two. So I guess that's what the question was related to. Um, and uh, it was very clear um, that uh, because the schools were mandated to open the windows and leave them open uh, during uh, occupancy of the rooms, uh, um, that meant that the CO2 didn't build up and there was plenty of good ventilation. Uh, and that was the point that Pat was making, uh, and that is that most schools don't have a, a designed a forced ventilation system, uh, and therefore where the future lies in this uh, is an interesting question, because if you have CO2 sensors in the space uh, with a dashboard and a feedback system, then you need to take an action if the CO2 levels become high, and you have a number of choices, and one of those is to open a window, Another one might be open a door or another one might be open windows when the room is not being occupied during breaks. Um, um, and that might assist in keeping the CO2 levels down. But uh, post COVID, it was very clear. It was the manual opening of windows um, that was right across the board in the 12 BAM houses. Um, and that was what was happening. And indeed, if, if some teacher did not open the window and had people in the room, that would have been very easy to spot. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I, I think we've run out of time. Uh, if there are further questions um, uh, to come up, uh, we'll, we'll take those at the end. There's a session for that. So I hand over now uh, to Ruth Kerrigan. Hi, everybody. Um, so that actually leads quite nicely into the next section, that last question and comment from Roger. Um, just to pick up on another one of the questions that was asked on the CO2 monitors or on the, the sensors in general, I actually brought some with me today for the people that are here. So these are the, the, the sensors that Ian was talking about. They're quite small, as you can see, and they just stick on the wall and they can all be pre-configured. And they hook up to the gateway, which is like this guy. So you can have a, a 3G SIM card in it or it can be connected via Wi-Fi. Um, and they've got a pretty good range of them as well. I have some in houses in my house I stayed at home to test some non-A-rated houses and I have houses probably about 12 houses away from my house and the, they're still pinging back to the gateway. Um, on the CO2, the issue about, you know, what the data on, how good is the data? When you calibrate them, you actually put them outside and then you calibrate them while they're outside. So the, the sensor from ELSIS is set to be, I think it's around 380 ppm, even though the ppm has gone up a bit since, since probably they developed these, but so when you put them outside, they calibrate them to that 380 ppm level. So then when you put them inside again, they're kind of based off that, that threshold from the outside air temperature. And we have noticed that they're probably plus or minus about 50 ppm. But because, you know, in, in rooms and in classrooms, it's really when you get over those thresholds of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. So that plus or minus 50 doesn't really kind of make too much of a difference. And then to give you an example of what I'm going to show here in a second, I also brought one of the dashboards with us. So this is what we're going to talk about next. Um, check if it's working now. Go back into the presentation, apologies. OK, so the idea was that kind of what was picking up on what Roger said there about um, using CO2 to control ventilation and how do we actually go about doing that? Um, initially, when we looked at this project, we were actually you know looking at CO2 from a point of view of students and classrooms and CO2 causing lethargy as the CO2 rises and hence children getting sleepy and not being able to concentrate. And then as we kind of went through this this project, um, we started to look at it from the COVID perspective and using CO2 to actually control ventilation in the spaces. Um, but from kind of talking with schools initially, one of the big questions we asked is, are teachers actually going to engage with, you know, a CO2 monitor and uh, do anything about it and the answer pretty much that came back from a lot of schools was no because the teachers don't have time they literally wouldn't even change a battery in something if it ran out so you know they just they, their their focus is on teaching as it should be in education and you know things like monitoring co2 in classrooms is not really going to be their priority which is very interesting given that the government um sent out co2 centers to lots of different schools which are just simple sensors that you put in a classroom and have a have a um a value and then a, a red green or an amber light the question we kind of would ask there is will the teacher actually do anything about it and we actually worked with a behavioral scientist who also has an environmental engineering background on this and can send out this blog afterwards if you look her up on on spotify uh katie patrick is her name 
Um, and she has done a lot of research into this area and has talked to a lot of people about how do you get people to actually take actions with respect to environmental engineering. So with anything with buildings, we all know that, you know, I might be sitting in a room and I might be cold and I might walk over and, and you know, increase the thermostat to make myself a bit warmer. But I don't actually know what impact that has on the energy. And then also, should I be doing that or should I be regulating my own temperature by putting on a jumper? So she's been doing a lot of like work in this area of, of how do we convey messages with respect to um, indoor environmental quality, whether that's temperature, whether that's um, CO2 or other things like that. And how do we actually get people to take actions? And based on that, we, we developed this type of dashboard. So going back to kind of the schools, the idea was let's not engage with the teacher because the teacher's too busy, but instead let's, let's engage with the students. So this was designed very much to be in mind with the student. And um, there was two kind of key points to this. Again, if you, if you listen to some of her blog, she talks quite a lot about this. And it's very simple and very obvious. But the two, one is colour and the other is animation. So as the, the colour goes from green to orange to red, um, the, obviously, you know, you're, you're going from green, which is good, to red, which is bad. And the animation of the little avatar there, which is supposed to represent your brain on oxygen, goes from being very happy to being, you know, not so happy to being sad to being quite, you know, um, um, devastated that something's going on here. So the idea is that, you know, we get the students to open the window as the colour changes and then the colour comes back down and they're rewarded by saying, great job, you know, we're back, we're back in the green zone again. Um, so that's kind of what I have here, live here to show you. So this is one example of that i hope you can all see that so that's basically connected to the center and to the gateway and that's what we feel is a much better solution for schools in particular getting students to take actions but even in other places like um restaurants etc uh, our offices or, or anywhere really um so to answer going back to kind of what we said before as well about the ventilation schools just to highlight this as well again this shows that, you know, before and after, before COVID measures were put in place and after COVID measures were put in place, the CO2 significantly decreased, as you can see from kind of the right hand side of that graph. The temperature actually, if you look at the bottom of it, the temperature didn't actually, um, we didn't go outside the temperature thresholds too much, even though you have to bring in perceived comfort into that. And anecdotally, the students would have said that they were cold. So that's something else that kind of has to be taken into account and into, into the factor. And then these were kind of then put into the classrooms to see do they work. Um, so we, we, we put them into four different schools in a couple of different classrooms. And as I said before, you go through the various um, levels of green to yellow to orange to red with the animation changing. And here's the result from one particular school. And uh, this was one of the primary schools. And you can see on the left hand side that before we put the dashboard in, the CO2 was uh, reaching pretty high peaks. I'm not sure if you can fully see it there, but it was over 2,000, close to 3,000 ppm. And then once we put the CO2 dashboards in, the CO2 dropped right down to below 1,500. But interestingly, when, we, when you actually look at it, it, while you might still have had a peak of 1,500, it was for a very short period of time. So the minute the dashboard kind of went up to that level, the kids were spotting it, they were opening the windows air was coming in and it was dropping straight back down again. So the time that you're spending over 1000 ppm was very, very short. And chatting with some of the kids afterwards, um, they, they really enjoyed it. They learned about CO2 and the impacts of CO2. You know, it was very clear and obvious for them what they had to do and when they had to do it, you know, highly visual. Um, and it's, um, it's, it, it's, I think it's a, it's a pretty good solution for schools. The other big impact of this was that, so not only you're targeting the, the students and not the teachers, um, because it, as you said, visual and, and engaging, but I think a really, really big important point of this, which Roger also alluded to, was that because you um, are able to capture the data via the sensor, so we're recording the data and we can keep that data, you can then provide a report to the school on a monthly basis to identify where classrooms perhaps are not using these CO2 monitors in an effective way. Um, so if there's maybe some classrooms where the students aren't engaging, you'll be able to pick that up and then go and tell the school, listen, you know, we need to get classroom X to engage and make sure that, that those windows have been opened so that we can mitigate both CO2 from a lethargy point of view, but also from um, mitigating um, the impact of COVID. So, um, yeah, so that's the that's kind of what we did with the CO2 dashboard. Um, any questions on that before I move on?
So there's a question there. So post lockdown COVID, people were more alert, active towards opening windows. Um, I think uh, there's two, two, two points to that. One was that post lockdown, the schools were mandated to open the windows. So they all had to do it. And if you hear some of the reports on the radio, a lot of the, a lot of the, the kids weren't particularly happy with it because they were quite cold. And even some of the secondary schools didn't want to go back to school after Easter because they felt that the indoor environmental quality was quite poor and they were having to wear, you know, hats and scarves and gloves and found it very difficult to to work in that environment. Um, but then with the dashboard uh, post COVID, yes, the dashboard was then used to, to tell them. So instead of having to maybe leave the window open all the time, only open it when the CO2 goes over a certain level. So that can help to kind of manage some of the um, the temperatures as well. And then another question was the cost of dashboards. So that's a really good question. So at the moment, we're looking at trying to see how you can maybe create um, um, a cheaper solution, because obviously this was just a prototype to see, can you get it all to work? So the sensors, the CO2 sensors are actually pretty expensive. They're up to 160 euro per sensor, but there is cheaper ones that you can get out there. And then also the what we were using was the likes of Samsung tablet. So you're having to purchase that. But what we are looking to do with this solution is actually buy the, the actual CO2 chip via um, the actual the one that goes inside this. Instead of buying the sensor, you just buy the chip, which you can get for like 20, 30 euro. And then you can actually uh, connect that directly to a, a tablet, um, a smaller interface tablet uh, and put that in and, and reduce the cost of that down to be less than 100 euro. And then obviously, if you start mass producing things, you can probably reduce costs even lower again. So, yeah, this is a prototype that we put together. So you wouldn't be going to roll this out, I think, it would be too expensive. And there's another question, what is the model of the sensor and the gate? So I'll actually stick it into the chat here. The um, It's uh, Elsus. Elsus is the name of the company that we bought the sensors from. And the gateway is a multi-tech gateway. As Ian said earlier on, if you go to the Things Network, um, that's where that's an open source platform that you can connect all of these things up. Um, and they have guidelines and GitHub and all other things like that, that you can, I think it's the Things Network actually, sorry, but I'll drop it into the chat there, you can Google it anyway. Okay, so if we move on to the, the next section then, um, the next section kind of leads into the performance gap analysis, which is also a big part of this project as to, you know, looking at the A-rated uh, school, the A-rated home and understanding um, where that performance gap is coming from. And I think if any of you are in this space of the performance gap, there's always already been quite a lot of published research on, on the performance gap and where it comes from. This kind of was, was trying to help us highlight how we can start to mitigate it and how we can use better tools to also um, look at the buildings in operation and, and help uh, look at the performance of the building now that it actually is in operation uh, and make sure that it starts to perform as per that design intent. So um, to get into this section, um, there's many types of digital twins. So we're hearing this term digital twin more and more often now, and there's lots of um, companies and technologies and products out there starting to uh, say that we have a digital twin. When you break it down, this is actually coming from, I think it's the Digital Twin Centre in Britain. I'm not sure, I can't remember which exact source. I'll, I'll find it out later and we can post it around. But there's three types of, of digital twin. The project digital twin, which is, is basically your BIM model. So that's your 3D geographical presentation that's used for the architects and the design and the, the construction of the building. You then have your asset digital twin, which is your data-driven digital twin. So that's all of the assets across your building, whether that's sensors, HVAC um, equipment, uh, what what assets are actually in the building and what data is associated with those assets but there's not necessarily a 3d model associated with that asset digital twin and then you have the performance digital twin and the performance digital twin is basically driving the performance of the building in operation um and there's there's you can do that using data and ai and machine learning or um the way we do it in is is to look at both the physics model and the data and start to bring the two together so this is what we call the IS performance digital twin. Um, on the left hand side at the top there, you have the physics enabled simulation. So that's the dynamic simulation model. That's the, the first principles physics model that you can create um, the, the, the 3D model and the simulate the, the physics of the energy and the heat and the flow throughout that building. And on the right hand side, you have the data from sensors. So whether that's an IoT network or a BMS um, system in the building, if you can get access to it. Um, and one augments the other. So basically what you're doing with the physics model is you're replacing any design assumptions or any compliance profiles 
with the information from your IoT and your BMS data. And on the other side, you're, you're then, because you now have that um, 3D real-time virtual representation of the building, you can now create virtual sensors. So instead of having to go and put in hundreds of, say, IoT sensors to collect more data, we can now create some virtual sensors, which then can be used for um, either training data or looking at different patterns or augmenting them through AI and machine learning. So basically, it's not a case of being one or the other when it comes to, say, data driven versus physics driven or uh, physics enabled versus AI and machine learning enabled. It's about leveraging the best of everything and bringing it all together to create that performance digital twin where you can now go and um, help that building perform as it should to its design intent. Um, and linking in with that, like this is going into the performance gap a little bit. Um, this is the well known S curve from Reba which you know basically shows that you, you start out at planning an initial design and you have um your your let's say your design intent is to be NZEB or A rated or lead gold or whatever it is. And we take all the boxes um at that stage to help us uh, to meet that compliance. But as you go through detailed design, you then start to um the, the curve starts to fall off because what the compliance doesn't take into account is for example unregulated loads. So it doesn't take into account things like your, your fit out, your server rooms, your IT, your small power, all of that, which also obviously have a massive impact on the energy design. Then you go through construction and things might get swapped out. So you might um, systems, you know, envelopes, materials all get swapped out all the time. But nobody in that construction phase ever checks, is that going to impact my energy model or is that going to affect my building and operation from the energy perspective? construction phase is all about how quickly can I build and when it comes to materials and sustainability it's you know what materials can I use and how, how less can I use them and make sure I don't have any waste but those things aren't taken into account at the construction phase to check is this going to impact my building and operation then we go through commissioning and um, as we know many buildings are commissioned quite poorly and then the building and operation and as I, I kind of said before the building is is um is, is generally operated to comfort and not to energy. If I'm cold, I'm going to turn my thermostat up, up but I'm not going to know how that's going to impact my my energy and my um, and, and the building's performance. So, you know, that's something that we really kind of have to start to to kind of address. And the fact is, we do spend 90 percent of our time indoors, but we are all concerned about the environment and employers and, um, you know, are expected to take steps to becoming more sustainable because of, you know, everything we're um hearing now about climate change finally people are you know starting to do something about it and um, there is also evidence out there that shows that employees in green certified buildings have higher cognitive function test scores possibly something to do with co2 levels and less lethargy and things like that but um you know they're designed we are sold this vision and this dream of an a-rated or an nz building and you're not necessarily sure that that's going to perform from both an energy and an indoor environmental quality perspective, unless you start to actually measure, verify and monitor that building in real time and check that it's performing as it should from both those, those aspects. Um, so within this project and, and um, we've taken that, you know, trying to take that to the next step. So taking that digital twin, calibrating it to a very high level um, uh, with respect to the building and operation and the building and use. That's done to international standards, um, IPMVP or ASHRAE 14.0. So it's obviously calibrated within the, the statistics that you must calibrate it to. But like we try to go way beyond that and try to, to actually calibrate within, you know, 5% because that's you, you want something that's actually representative of how, the, of how the building's operating. And the other drive, I suppose, that we're trying to also achieve is, is you know, how do we now change the, the whole sector to start taking into account the fact that our buildings at the planning and initial design stage don't perform um, like they should in operation. So we have this, what we call, this was presented at a SIBSI conference um, earlier on this year, and we're kind of coining this the U-curve. So the idea is that as you go through these detailed design, construction, commissioning phases, you update the model as you go. You take into account how the building is actually going to be used from a fit out and um, a, an unregulated load perspective when you go through the construction phase you know actually give information back to the design teams as to how changes are going to impact the building and operation that of course brings in interoperability between tools because you know during your construction decisions have to be made quickly so how do we do that so i think we're 
still quite a way away from having all of these things work together quickly, seamlessly, that decisions can be made quickly and don't impact things like procurement times. But commissioning is, is an easy one that you can quickly address because if you have that model now updated as you go through the commissioning process, instead of just ticking the box to check that the systems are put in place, we can now actually start to um, commission the building in a more positive way to make sure the building's going to perform um, based on any of those changes that have also been made. And then we can start to look at the building in operation in real time and make sure that the building actually performs to that design intent. That final model at that point is probably going to be very different to that initial compliance model. But the whole point is we're trying to meet that design intent and we're trying to help the building achieve what it set out to achieve. Otherwise, you know, we have the best built environment on paper with respect to our envelope and our systems, but we don't actually achieve any of our carbon emission reductions because you know, nobody's actually paying attention to what's happening in the in the building. And I think this is something that we really observed with the A-rated homes. Um, and we have a couple of papers on this as well that you can check out. But this is something that we really kind of observed with the A-rated homes and that vast differences between uses, even when you only had two people in the, the home versus five people in the home. You think the home with five people would, would have a higher energy consumption than two people and actually no, not always the case. So, you know, it's it's an obvious one. People behavior and their operation obviously is going to make a massive impact as to how much energy we, we use and how that impacts um, our overall carbon emission reduction target. And the last thing I'll, I'll kind of point out on this is that um, once you have that you know real time digital twin, not only can we um, address the performance gap, drive the performance gap down, eliminate the performance gap. Now we can see how we can go even further. So we might be designing the NZEB building today. And we might have, you know, a couple of years, but by the time that building starts the, the process from design and planning through to it being constructed and operated and things with climate change are moving so fast that, you know, in a couple of years time, the requirement might be um, zero energy buildings or even positive energy buildings. So all of these existing buildings that are being designed today for NZEB are in the future going to have to actually perform even better. So by creating that operational digital twin, you now have a digital asset that can be utilized along with the building over its timeline. And it can be used to, to optimize its energy, make sure it's performing as it should, optimize health and well-being, optimize both together, but also plan future retrofits, integration of renewables, decarbonization strategies, driving it towards ever, or driving it towards positive energy. So this is kind of one of the big things that kind of has come from this project and that we're also try, trying to drive within IES is to see how, how can we actually um, really drive the transformation of the construction sector and create those digital assets for the buildings that we can utilise over the life cycle of the whole building and not just kind of hand over the keys and walk away and say job done, but we don't actually achieve any carbon emission reduction targets. So I'll hand over to Ian to kind of finish the second half of this and then we can take any questions at the end. Yeah, thanks very much, Ruth. And um, so bringing it back uh, to Amber, what we're trying to do with these calibrated digital twins is bridge the performance gap between all the uh, with all the Amber buildings. So as we mentioned, we use the building data to create digital twins of these buildings in operation. And we believe these calibrated models of these buildings is the most accurate assessment of the building energy rating. And this helped us identify key parameters within the BERs of the housing estates and commercial buildings that affect the performance gap. So again, it's the physics based model and the operational data, and that gives the truest representation compared to the actual building. So with the next few slides, I just want to give you some insights and some case studies and some interesting results we got from our performance gap analysis, starting with um, our the domestic or our residential buildings. And as you can see, you can see the breakdown of what our model is suggesting compared to what the BER is suggesting. Um, our model there in the graphs you see are in blue. And the first thing uh, to bring to your attention, and this may be obvious to a lot of people who are involved with BERs and designing buildings, is that the BER has an absence of plug loads, appliances and small electrical devices. This is due to the occupational nature of these devices. So the BER is an asset rating and it'll always be an asset rating. You, we need an asset rating in Ireland to compare different buildings, regardless of who's living in them. But this is causing a lot of difficulty for designers who want to accurately estimate um, energy models, energy efficiency. 
And it's causing a lot of problem for a lot of homeowners and people like that as well, as they buy an A-rated building and their energy bills don't match the BR rating that they have. So this is something we could quantify using our calibrated model in IES. The next interesting results, one of many I should say as well, is that we noticed a lot of the time across the board in the residential buildings when doing this energy gap analysis that there was an overestimation on the space heating in domestic buildings. Now, there could be a lot of different reasons for this, but what we saw from our model and what we saw um, when talking to the residents and looking or looking at our occupant surveys, that we suggest that this heat loss is actually due to additional ventilation or a lot of window and door operation. So basically all the occupants want to maintain low levels of CO2, they open windows, open doors, and then that's what causes the heat loss. Other potential things could be the trickle vents and uncertainties about infiltration levels within the BER. Moving on towards the HSC buildings. So we had three HSC buildings, all primary care center and res residential facilities for uh, patients with all the equipment and doctors within the buildings. And what was a really interesting case study for these HSC buildings was that the BER simulation assumes a, pro a profile with a low setback temperature, about 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. But we, we can confirm this with the air temperature data that we're collecting with the sensors and looking at the model. It was suggested that, and obviously we can talk to all the facility managers on site and, th and talk to them as well, that all of those buildings were being operated 24 seven with no set mechs. But if you follow the regulations that you showed, that's the profile you should get on the BER. So obviously that was causing a big gap when we did the analysis using our digital twin. And another, or moving on to the schools that we did the performance gap analysis on, one of the big things in the school actually was the lighting and how coming back to the occupational nature of all the amber buildings or of all the buildings that it's hard to represent on the BER. Lighting assumes a certain type of lighting depending on the use of the building. But once talking to the principals, if you're in a school, the lights are on all the time, regardless of uh, what time of year it is or what time of the day it even is. The lighting is just always on in a school. So this doesn't match what was being shown on the BER. And a similar trend was uh, a present in the educational buildings as it was in the HSC buildings, that it was assumed at a more low operating temperature, whereas in reality, the air temperature data confirmed that it was a little bit higher over a daily profile. So just to kind of summarize some of our insights as well, we've done a lot of analysis on all of these buildings. With, uh, I think now we have an 80 page report detailing all the assumptions and comparing things back and a sensitivity analysis. But just to really kind of summarize it in this slide, some of the things that we've looked at that caused the performance gap within the amber buildings, uh, the lack of appliances and plug loads and whether a recommendation would be to include something uh, within the BER that accommodates this to some extent, at least, as I mentioned, the BER is an ASS rating, so you can't account for too much, but maybe something should be there in the calculation. Uh, potential adjustments to set point profiles and setbacks, because we've noticed a lot from our own research that these weren't as accurate as it could be. Within domestic hot water, um, potentially more research is necessary to better understand consumption, especially in residential buildings. However, a lot of the new regulations and the latest versions of the domestic BER have shown this. Uh, I know there's a new domestic hot water survey and a new shower survey that is, is present in the methodology now. Uh, lighting loads, the kind of same. This comes back to the occupational nature of the buildings. Maybe we should be looking at the usage patterns and the assumptions used in the methodology, as we noticed that some of the lighting profiles were not represented correctly. And the last thing, more weather files with a greater variety of locations throughout Ireland will obviously make the whole process more accurate with the BER. And that's it for that section. And um, if anybody has any questions on that, feel free to let me know. Or any questions for Ruth Kerrigan and uh, her presentation on digital twins. No, every, maybe everything was perfect, so.
So um, hopefully I've understood your question correctly, but you say what benchmark uh, to, for the profile model, what we did was we used the real data that we got from the building. So we used real energy data from either the domestic or the commercial buildings, and that's what we used to create an energy profile to calibrate the model. And then we compared that, got the same metrics, the kilowatt hours per meter squared, and compared it back to the BER that way. And do you have any indication? Any indication to the improvement in X? Um, I don't think so, but that would be a really interesting metric to actually produce from the performance cap analysis. Say if we have a, a comparison of say the how. And I think, yeah. So if that's with the SIBSA or one of the protocols we've mentioned, they have to calibrate it within five percent. So that's how accurate it is in regards to that. And were there any air tightness results available for the buildings? Uh, I don't think we had any air tightness results as part of the performance gap analysis, but it'd be interesting to see that. And we looked at kind of a uh, defect air tightness had on IEQ while looking at the data on iScan. And there goes through uh, kind of backing up the IMPVP that it should be in just within a 5% threshold. Um, I don't see anyone typing up a new question or anything like that, so I think we're okay uh, to move on to the next section. If anybody does have a question on the performance gap, feel free to ask and we'll do it after this section anyway. There we go. Yeah, so the next uh, section I want to talk about is the wellness analysis that we did for the A-rated buildings. So one of the most important things uh, within the AMBER project was the health and well-being of all of the buildings, but all the domestic and commercial. So what we wanted to do was do a comparison of all the AMBER buildings and compare that back to the well credits, compare it back to the standards used within well and all the assumptions. So basically what we're trying to do here is the meter.eq data versus the well credits and seeing the results that we get. So similar to what my colleagues uh, Pat and Roger would have shown earlier on, uh, this is the two metrics provided in the well standard. They look at optimal IEQ within a building is less than 800 ppm. And what we're looking at here now is a analysis of all the domestic properties in a certain estate that was part of Amber and the percentage of time that that building was above 800 parts per million, which is what you use to measure CO2. And that shows it's a relatively good CO2 within those buildings in the, in the living room. So it's about 20% of the time above that threshold. But when you change over and look at the master bedroom, you can see there, if I switch between them, the increase is quite significant between the living room and the master bedroom. This is obviously because CO2 values in the main bedroom are much higher than in the sitting room. And people aren't aware of the CO2 buildup that happens at night nice, and excessive CO2 levels largely go undetected. So we can clearly see this, that it's increased a lot. It went from 20 or just above 20% to over 40% in the master bedroom. This um, analysis was touched on during Pat Shields presentation, but it's good to bring it up again in regards to wellness. So something very interesting happened during the project, the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously we had good data before COVID-19 pandemic, and we could see how the buildings are being operated afterwards. So here we have uh, one particular school that was showing high levels of CO2. Again, the optimal CO2 is less than 800 ppm. And on average, classrooms are presenting CO2 levels above 1200 ppm. And this is before the COVID-19 pandemic. Over after the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see a significant reduction. And this comes back to one of your questions actually earlier on, Asset. It's not that they were more alert or more active. They were told to keep windows open. The rule was 
after COVID-19 and once schools started to reopen was keep the windows open, even though it was cold, it was between uh, October time and December time. So you can see the effect that that had on the CO2. And if there was a reduction of CO2 build up at about 30% in the classrooms. Again, coming back to my earlier point, CO2 build up is very bad in classrooms because of the high occupational nature and it can affect the student's concentration. And also what was interesting about this uh, analysis as well, after the windows were open and the windows were kept open in all the classrooms, we still actually had a little bit of CO2 build up in one particular room if you look where the red arrow is pointing. So it did identify the worst performing rule and that's where we'd have to go back and kind of ask questions of, well, what is going on with that room? And is there anything that could be causing the CO2 build up? Because the windows should be open in this scenario. But what's good uh, for CO2 might be very, very bad for comfort levels and indoor temperature and thermal comfort. So another calculation we did within the wellness analysis within AMBER was we used a predicted mean vote, which assesses the thermal comfort for occupants. And we performed this on an hourly basis within the project. So the same idea again, before and after COVID. So on the left hand side, you see before. And what with this analysis comes four different categories of comfort. And you can see that in the highest category, there were 24% of the time uh, they were in this uh, comfort category before the COVID pandemic. However, using the same methodology and applying it to the data after the pandemic, you can see that number drops down to 11%. So again, what I uh, go back to what was good for CO2 and good for the CO2 levels in the classroom it may have been bad for the students and the teachers who actually had to be present in the room and potentially cold and not in the right comfort range during the COVID-19 pandemic. And just using the same analysis and applying, applying it to the domestic buildings that I would have showed on the first slide, it's the same comfort categories, four comfort categories, and then out of range uh, is when the house would not be comfortable using the same predicted mean vote calculation procedure. And you see 64% of the times they're in the highest category levels, one and two, with only 7% of the time out of the comfort range. But what that doesn't really show actually, no, sorry, what that 7% means is that's the average across all the houses. But if you can look at the actual graph to the left hand side of that, you can actually see potentially the worst performing houses in terms of time or comfort. So this gave a really good indication of potentially houses we need to go back to ask, do an occupant comfort survey and just kind of engage with those occupants to see if this analysis that we're doing is can be confirmed and whether there's anything we can do to improve their thermal comfort levels. And that's it for the wellness analysis uh, within uh, the AMBER project. If anybody has any questions on that, feel free to ask before we move on to the next section. Nope. I think it's all pretty much self-explanatory. And um, yeah, I think we can move on with the next section. And again, apologies to one of our project colleagues here, Pat Shield. Unfortunately, at short notice, he wasn't able to attend. Uh, so that's why we've done the pre-recording. He was, um, and we can just go through that. The next section will focus on the impact of COVID-19 what it has on the design of buildings and we'll let Pat explain. Hello again, so just back to talk a little bit about some COVID recommendations in terms of reopening commercial buildings and the fact that we seem to be in a position where we're going to have to learn to look at this thing. Um, so we have seen that the transmission of COVID and possibly other dangerous seasonal pathogens occur obviously due to coughing, sneezing, breathing comparatively close to one another. The World Health Organization recommendation of one meter social distancing um, in, in contrast to the vast majority of governments around the world uh, is based on a mistaken notion about droplet sizing in aerosols and the likely transmission below that size. So 
And it appears that COVID is well capable of being transmitted in an aerosol of significantly smaller size. And as a result, can actually remain in the air for substantially longer than is shown on this chart here. Okay, so if it's 100 microns in size, chances are it'll travel about a meter or so. But if it's an awful lot smaller, it can actually remain in the air for a substantial number of hours. And it appears that the COVID mechanism of transmission is probably the latter as opposed to the former. So after a, a fairly strong amount of nudging, the World Health Organization followed the recent research which has shown that both aerosol and airborne transmission mechanisms are at play. Um, the, the US CDC in particular had adopted an approach since the early 1950s that aerosol transmission of pathogens do not occur particularly effectively at under 100 micron and droplet sides. But uh, thank God that the level of frenetic research on both airborne and aerosol transmission has probably debunked this notion and the World Health Organization have finally come out and said there is a possibility or there is growing evidence at least that there is um, transmission occurring because of both mechanisms. And this is a very, very welcome thing. However, this has major implications for, for an awful lot of things with regard to how we ventilate and uh, particularly how we filter air in spaces in commercial buildings in particular. There was an especially interesting example shown on the previous slide with regard to a CFG or computational fluid dynamics calculation that was done on the original restaurant in which the first COVID case appeared. Um, and we can clearly see that the ventilation that is present in that restaurant space is extremely ineffective. And I suspect if we were to examine the vast number of restaurants around the world, we'd probably find something similar. Um, so, the other thing to say about it is that the length of time, obviously, if one is exposed to bad air, let's call it, or pathogen uh, laced air, um, is obviously going to have an effect on the likelihood of infection. And finally, to say that the, the level of relative humidity within a particular space, especially in a commercial building, uh, where there's a lot of fixing going on, um, is particularly important. So we can see that beyond certain points of OH levels, beyond 60 or so, so we can see that certain pathogens are extremely successful in having a long life, and below certain levels, similar things happen with other forms of Pathogens. So in general, the recommendations are, if possible, and obviously this is not particularly easy unless the building is already controlled for ORH, and it is recommended that the ORH levels are kept within or somewhere in between 40 and 60 percent. And as I say, in a lot of cases, that is not going to be possible. So as, as we can see on the slide here, there are, there are a large number of extremely influential organizations who have, who have kind of weighed in on this and offered opinions. And um, it's important that they do, given that they are involved in the specification of ventilation control systems the world over. And uh, this would include various organizations like ASHRAE and SIPSI and so on. So they have, they have all issued what they're terming as engineering controls to make sure that the air quality remains high. So we can see that the ventilation levels of fresh air, controlling RH, and how air is filtered, the elimination of recirculated air, okay, and the use of other items like UV, GI uh, devices in space. So as I mentioned earlier, the most important item here, um, other than the surface being clean, so this is a non-engineering control, but certainly in terms of the recirculation. So both ASHRAE and SIPSI are, are seeking to avoid the recirculation of old or stale air, even though that air is warmed. Okay? 
They are also looking at the filtration of all air, air intakes up to, in essence, medical grade standards. They are looking to keep uh, CO2 levels should be at or below 800 parts per million at all times, which is going to be a real travel. And early morning ventilation uh, is obviously comparatively easy, especially in Ireland and the UK. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, or H levels to be kept within that 40 to 60 range. Um, but I should also add that uh, the very last point there um, is that the, there, is, there is observed evidence, and the evidence is getting stronger, that an awful lot of commercial buildings in Ireland and the UK simply depend upon the amount of warm, recirculated, stale air coming back into the building in order to lower their energy bills. In other words, they don't have to eat as much air. Um, and it has been shown in several cases, and I've been involved in maybe three or four of them over the past year, that the buildings themselves with the plant installed for heating and cooling are actually incapable of operating on full fresh air. So it will be extremely interesting to see what happens here over the next year or two. So I love this final slide here, just as an extract, the SIPC engineering control recommendations. They are almost the same as the previous page. I won't go through them, but they're, they're just supplied here for information purposes only. Um, so I, I think overall, the lessons to be learned are the most important one probably being that fresh air is probably the most important thing. And as we're seeing within the schools and the HSE buildings, CO2 being used as a proxy for the level of fresh air. Um, it is so important that that fresh air is maintained um, and, is, and is kept going. And if government guidance is required to try and implement that or to keep it, keep it implemented really, then that's exactly what we need to do. But for absolute sure, there is more research required. Um, and if anyone listening um, is involved, Amber is obviously coming to a finish but if you're starting out on this path, uh, by all means, we can we can share data with you if it helps to alleviate this problem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, apologies uh, for Pat Shield not being able to make it here today. Um, even though Pat took the lead on looking at the COVID-19 and how that impacts buildings, we're still happy to take any questions here, the project team. If there is any on path section. And um, just to answer an earlier question, yes, there will be a recording available afterwards. And um, we I'll set up a cloud link that you can access to the recording and I'll send it to all participants. And then we have an answer from Ruth in regard to the one of the air tightness questions from earlier on. And I think that's it. If no one has any questions right now, and um, we can move on to the last section. Uh, and the last section covers um, the partnership between the Amber project team and O'Cool and Co-Housing Alliance. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, they were a very, very valuable partner due to all of their residents being really focused on energy efficiency, sustainability issues, and really engaged on learning about IEQ and learning how to improve IEQ in their homes and the effects of it. So before I ask you to come up on stage, um, I just have a quick snapshot of all of the kind of O'Coolin basically achievements that we uh, got over the last couple of years while working on the Amber project. So in the top left hand corner there, you can see one of the digital twins for one of O'Coolin's houses, one of the main architects. So we use that digital twin to inform operational performance and this prevented the need for intensive submetering and helped with ensuring that the design intent was met in regards to energy and carbon emission targets. In return, in regards to the data analytics, and the data insights that we gathered through iScan, there was over 66,240 data points 
analysed for all of their cooling properties and it is highlighting the importance of the IEQ along with energy efficiency to all of their residents and to the cooling company. And there you can see an image of some of the analysis and myself actually installing some of the sensors in the houses in Ballymont. And the last thing I would say is that uh, as part of the project, we set up a lot of resident evenings for um, the Okulin uh, residents. And uh, we also set up a clinic actually. So that resident evening there you see in the top right hand corner, we had that before the project. We had a couple of them before the project to get them engaged and to kind of explain to them some of the terms that were important to the project. Then afterwards, we had a clinic where anyone that wanted more information about their data and more information about the project, they could come and have one on one chats with any members of the project team. And now I think I'd like to ask uh, Hugh Brennan, who is the uh, CEO of Okulun, to come up and just talk a little bit about the project and Okulun in general. Thank you very much, Ian. And um, I have to say uh, thank you very much to my uh, new colleagues um, who worked on this um, program with us or on this project with us. Um, we were definitely the beneficiaries of um, all of this work, and um, as were our uh, uh, purchasers or our, our 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 members who, as you can see from the information that has um, been presented, um, were very keen to be involved and engaged, um, I think, very well with the team. And uh, part of the reason for that was because of the uh, professional nature in which the work was um, carried out and um, in which the interactions uh, between the team and um, our members um what was, was was carried out um you 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 also heard that um when we initially um looked at our data and um and then held meetings with the members and advised them of changes that they could make and um, to improve the um air quality and uh, comfort in their homes and and you could see then from the following data how um effective that advice was and that's that was that's hugely beneficial um to us and and uh, obviously to you know to our members and and to the purchasers um also we were able to use the data to actually redesign or to make a small um tweak if you like in the design of, of the of the ventilation system and specifically that related to um the um, air ext extract from the second bedroom. So as was described earlier, this is a um, demand control ventilation system um, as against the full mechanical uh, heat, heat recovery system. This, this, this is demand control, so it's running 24-7 uh, um, extracting air and um, the um, air then, the air intake is through the trickle vents as, 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 as was described. Um, but the extract points are um, in the kitchen, um, in the bathroom downstairs, in the ensuite, in the main bedroom upstairs, and in the bathroom upstairs. And um, they, th those particular vents are, are then controlled by a relative humidity. So um, whereas the system is running 24-7, um, the vents will open and close uh, depending on the demand. Um, so we, we we found that we weren't happy with the air extract in the second bedroom in particular because there wasn't a vent in in the room so when we looked into it and looked into putting a vent in the room um we were told that it probably wasn't appropriate because um it's uh, it can be quite quite noisy whereas all of the other vents were not in areas where, which would disturb people's sleep so eventually what we decided on doing um was to put a vent over the door in the second bedroom, an ordinary um, air, air vent, and then have the extract vent in the ceiling of the landing outside. And that is, in fact, what we are doing in our current uh, project. Now, we won't know how effective that is until the houses are finished and people um, um, have moved in. But we do intend to continue with what we're calling our post-occupancy um, 
research. So um, that's really it. You know, um, I again just want to reiterate my thanks to all the to all the colleagues and to the um, the you know the 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 way that this program was was uh, pro project was was uh, carried out. And if there are any questions, um, I will be happy to take them. Thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, thanks very much, Hugh. And I should say all the all of the speakers as well as you as contact details will be given at the end. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask now or drop us a line after uh, we wrap up. And no, I don't see any new questions uh, put into the chat. So just to go back to the presentation. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for attending and um, again we can use this time for another question if anyone has any so feel free to put them into the chat or alternatively uh, feel free to reach out of us and um, we're very grateful that you gave us two hours of your time so make sure to follow up on it and ask us any questions how it might be relevant to what you guys are doing as well and make the most out of what you kind of heard today and obviously I'd like to thank everyone in the room here as well so I guess if there is no further questions, I guess we can end the meeting. So thanks very much for attending everyone.